And we mentioned the dilatation because then with that, uh, we can define some other sort of material properties, right? So, you know, again, we're constitutive model is something that relates stress to strain. And strain rate, strain relates uh, to displacement. Right? So this is, gets us from displacement to stress. And there are material properties in between, right? So some of them, the ones that are sort of easy to find physically are listed here, okay? So the Young's modulus, you sort of already know, right? This is, if I go to the lab and I have a bar, a sample, and I pull on it or push on it, right? And I measure the force, right? So I measure the force. And this bar has some cross section, right? So then my, and it, this is the, we'll say this is the x1 direction. Right? So then my stress in the s in the one in the one one direction is equal to the force over the area, right? My engineering stress. And I can put a little strain gauge on my sample, and I can measure the strain, right? So then s11 over e11, which is also the slope of the stress-strain curve in 1D, that's Young's, Young's modulus. Right? So this is also called, sometimes called the, just called the elastic modulus. Right? So the bulk modulus then <coughs> is in analogy with the elastic modulus except now we're looking at volume deformation. So I got my cube, right? I have my cube. And I'll apply a stress to each side, uh, S11, S22, S33. And of course, there's opposite on all sides, right? And then my cube's going to deform into something smaller. Uh, I think we already defined the hydrostatic stress, which is the sum. It's the average of the normal stresses. Right? So then the bulk modulus is the hydrostatic stress over the volumetric stress. Right? Or if you were to plot that, right, the hydrostatic stress versus the volumetric stress, this is K. Right? So in words, I guess, uh, you know, in words, the, the Young's modulus is the <coughs> sort of materials resistance, right? It's the materials resistance to Uniaxial deformation. That's the Young's modulus or elastic modulus. Right. The bulk modulus is the material's resistance to hydrostatic compression, right. squeezing on all sides of the block. It's, also, it's a measure of the material strength in that under under that load. Right. So the shear modulus then, if I have my little cube, and I deform it in such a way that pure shear deformation, something like this, right? so I deform it like that, then the shear modulus is uh, the ratio of the shear stress to the shear strain. In this, in this case, I just chose one, com one shear stress and one shear strain. And if the material is isotropic, meaning it has infinite planes of symmetry, I could substitute any of the other ones, right? So I could also have 1, 2, 1, 2, or 2, 3, 2, 3, right? And I'd always have the same shear modulus. But if a material is anisotropic, you, you could have different shear moduli depending on which direction you try to shear. Right? 
And so then finally, the Poisson ratio, um, oops, the Poisson ratio is sort of a secondary material property, but you know, it's if I have a material. And I pull on it. Such that it deforms. Anytime I pull on the material, even if I apply an axial load, it's going to shrink in the vertical direction. So in this case, I'm I apply the load in a pure longitudinal way, but in the vertical, you know, or apply the load purely horizontally. And in the vertical, the material shrinks. And that ratio of how much it, you elongate it to how much it shrinks is the Poisson ratio. Right? And so typically, yeah? Uh, for a linear material, it's assumed to be a constant. And the, the two probably most common that you see uh, in terms of actual measurements are the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, because you can actually get them in one, in, in one experiment, right? You can, you can go to the lab. You can go to the lab. And to measure, you know, we already talked about how you'd measure Young's modulus, right? You pull on the bar, and you affix a little strain gauge to it, right? And therefore, you can get the Young's modulus, right? Well, all I have to do is affix another strain gauge longitudinally, like this. And in one test, I can also get the, the, the uh, Poisson ratio. Right? And then as we'll see in a second, as long as the material is isotropic, then these are all related to one another. You can get any of the other. Uh, can the Poisson ratio ever be negative? Hmm? So when I when I that would imply that when I pull on this, the material instead of shrinking, it actually gets fatter. So let's say no, no naturally occurring material has a, <laughs> has a positive Poisson ratio. It's, it's actually a very active area of research to have materials that have negative Poisson ratios. And they're toys and stuff. But these are sort of man-made or, or architected. And so in, in, a, in a, you know, a hot area of material science research is sort of nano-architecting materials. So now with, with 3D printing, and you know, I mean, we, can, we can actually control like using lithography techniques we can basically polymerize materials one phonon at a time. And so you can build very, very small materials. Uh, there's a, a professor at, at Caltech, Julia Greer, who does some really interesting research where you know, if, you, if you look at the materials she's building, if you, if you hold them in your hand, you can't see them because they're mostly air. They're, and, you know, they're a few millimeters long by a few micrometers thick. And you hold it in your hand, you can't even see it's there because it's mostly air. But if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like the Eiffel Tower. It has all this sort of architecture and stuff. And so uh, through n sort of nano-architecting materials, then you know, when you deform the materials, you can get hinges. right? You can get materials that will collapse in certain ways and other things. And you can build materials that have negative Poisson ratio. And of course, this is very like, inter interesting. I mean, one, one obvious application would be like if you had a bulletproof vest. And it was made of a uh, negative Poisson ratio of material. It'd be a very effective way to stop a bullet because what you're saying is when the bullet hits it, instead of spreading out and getting less dense, it actually is going to, you know, get more dense in that region. That's going to provide a you know, more effective way to stop a bullet. And so, the, have I seen what? Luke Cage. It's like a c comic book character. <laughs> 
Well, I think a lot of them actually do that, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. When when I was uh, I had a colleague at at Sandia that actually worked on bullets like that would be fired from small arms rifles, so small, just a bullet, not a not like a missile that's launched from a plane, but a bullet that was like guided, so you could like shoot the bullet and it would turn around the corner and like a, like a missile. <laughs> so. It's a, it's a, I should probably take that off the recording. <laughs> okay, so some typical Young's modulus values for materials that we care about, uh, rocks, right? They're, you know, typically in the, Sort of 60 gigapascal-ish range is a sort of a good average for a rock, 60 gigapascals. Um, uh, I guess a little bit, a little bit lower for shells. There's not as much data here. The the colors indi indicate just the porosity values of these different rocks. So as sort of as as expected. Uh, the, the materials with lower porosity, so the light colors or low porosities, tend to ha tend to be a little more stiff, right? Which you, you kind of expect if there's if the porosity is higher, there's there's more air in the material than there is material, right? And so uh, so the ones with lower porosities are are more typically more stiff. And these are just sort of limestones that are all bend together, right? Because there's lots of different, you know, Indiana limestone. Or there's lots of different limestones, but that's just a um, sort of in the range of some real data. Same for Poisson ratio. You know, typically for rocks, I think about 0.2 is, a, is like a decent average. Some are less, some are, you know, which is, you know, that's this, this typical. Like, we don't uh, pull or push on a rock. It doesn't tend to expand or contract very much before we fail it, right, uh, in an unconfined way. So... Again, uh, what about, you know, I know this is a geomechanics class, but, you know, some of you might go work in drilling or other things which also require mechanics, and things like Young's modulus and Poisson ratio are important. What are, for a material like steel, uh, what, what do you, what's a good rule of thumb for Poisson ratio? Anybody know? For steel? It's a little, a little higher than that, about 0.3. 0.33 is usually what I use. You know, if I don't have an actual measurement, I use 0.33. What about aluminum? About uh, 0.29 maybe yeah. for for the Poisson ratio. Um, you know, for Young's modulus, steel is like uh, steel is like 200 GPA, right? so it's like twice as strong as a rock. 200 GPA. What's interesting, you know, you have lots of different uh, steels, you know, gosh, hundreds of different alloyed steels and all that. It, the alloy of the steel and, and, and doesn't tend to affect the Young's modulus very much. It's, it's like typically always fairly close to like 200 GPA. It, what it affects is the toughness of the material and, you know, the sort of inelastic response. So after you, you get, you know, remember the Young's modulus is just the elastic part of the stress strain curve, but if you, if you continue to deform a material like a metal, it'll deform plastically, right, uh, for for quite a long way. Uh, so it'll stretch. You know, you think of it like a paperclip, right? You know, every time you you bend a paperclip, if you pull it out and, and it doesn't spring back to where it was, you, you you plastically deformed it, right? And you can continue to do that for a long time before you ever break the paperclip. Right? So that's all plastic deformation, and it can. Uh, so it's it's really the different alloys of steels affect much more the the inelastic or the plastic response than they do the Young's modulus. Uh, 